before I start talking um, and say all of our lovely welcome remarks, I do want to make sure that our live stream is up and running. So I appreciate everyone's patience. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so there's no feedback loop. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to, to West Seattle by Streetcar, 1914 to 1940. My name is Taylor Roden, and I'm the Community Events Manager here at Historic Seattle. Our mission at Historic Seattle is saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. Um, we're really excited to have Mike with us today for this program. But before we get, get going and hear all that Mike has to share, I do want to thank our sponsors. Um, for their ongoing support of our work. So thank you to the Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Local One, Washington and Alaska. Thank you Daniels Real Estate, the Greystone and the Lodge at St. Edward Park. And thank you to Selen Construction. And I also want to share with you all our land acknowledgement. Many of you know that we've been working on this for quite some time and I'm excited um, that we finally are able to share this with you. So um, with that, Historic Seattle knows that our properties and our programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. This acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities, um, <clears throat> sorry, or for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history, but it's the first step in recognizing the people whose land we occupy. So today, um, like I said, we're joined by Mike Bergman, a longtime transportation enthusiast who will share with us the history of the West Seattle streetcar system and its impact um, on the on public transit in Seattle. So really interesting. I had the privilege of getting a preview of this a couple of months ago. Um, I'm really excited to hear it again and also hear your questions. So throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A to submit your questions. And then after Mike is done with the lecture, he'll, um, I'll field some questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have together. So with that, welcome Mike and let's get started. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I hope I'm coming through okay. Um, uh, this is uh, Two West Seattle by streetcar. Uh, electric streetcars were running, running on rails and receiving power from overhead trolley wire. They were the first uh, main form of public transportation in Seattle, starting uh, from the 1890s and running until the early 1940s when they were replaced by motor buses and trolley coaches. Seattle's streetcar lines started as private companies, which were eventually acquired by the city of Seattle in 1919. The city owned streetcar system was known as the Seattle Municipal Street Railway. Uh, and as most Seattle residents know, West Seattle is a peninsula separated from the rest of the city by the Duwamish River. The first streetcar line in West Seattle didn't go downtown. It opened in 1895 as a short cable car line running from the Admiral District to a ferry that connected to downtown Seattle on Harbor Avenue. In 1907, the first direct streetcar service was opened up between uh, West Seattle and downtown, and it served the Fauntleroy neighborhood. By 1914, there were four streetcar lines connecting West Seattle with downtown. So how did these lines cross the Duwamish River, travel across Harbor Island, and reach downtown through the Soto neighborhood? Let's take a brief photo tour and find out. Next slide, please. Um, I'll advance your slide in just a second, Mike, but it sounds like some folks can't hear you. I'm wondering if we can either raise the volume or if we could just speak a little bit louder. All right. I'll, I'll see if I can fix that a little bit here. Thank you. And yes, of course, next slide. <laughs> OK, so this map shows um, the Seattle streetcar net network as it existed in 1935. And in that year, the streetcar system was mostly intact. There have been a few abandonments, but um, most of the lines uh, were still running and they carried the vast majority of, of transit passengers in Seattle. So if we look uh, at West Seattle here towards the lower left portion of the map, there's actually four separate lines there. 
uh, that used a common path between downtown and Spokane Street. They came down First Avenue South uh, at this particular point in time, went across Spokane Street, and then split into uh, four different ends. Um, the, uh, the number one route was the Alki Avenue route that followed the shoreline, Harbor Avenue and Alki Avenue, out to Alki Point, and it ended in a little off street loop just a few blocks um, uh, south of, of where the White House is. Route two um, went from Spokane Street out to Avalon Way and uh, to the California and Alaska Junction and then headed south to uh, the Fauntleroy neighborhood and ended at this, what was then the city limits uh, at Roxbury Street. Route three uh, turned north from the West Seattle Junction and went up California Avenue to Atlantic Street. And that's, that was actually kind of a remnant of that original um, line that connected the, the Harbor Island Ferry to the West Seattle Junction. Now in 1935, there was a tiny, tiny little remnant of fourth line um, here numbered Route 4 that um, started in the Youngstown area uh, of Spokane Street just after you crossed the bridge and then headed south on West Marginal Way. Now up until um, 1931 that line had gone all the way to Burien. It was a long interurban line and it had gradually been cut back um, over the, the succeeding years uh, from that point. Um, so we're going to cover um, the basic corridor that ran from um, the uh, west end of Spokane Street um, to downtown Seattle in more or less geographic order. Um, am I still coming through there? A couple of folks have messaged that it's still a little hard to hear. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Let's try that. See if I'm a little louder. Um, I think that sounds better. Um, folks, if you could just keep giving us feedback in the chat, that would be really great. Okay. So can we have our next slide here? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, for some reason, my, my pictorial view here of the slides is not coming through. Um, and I'm going to, I don't know why here, but we'll see what happens. Um, so this is the earliest photo in today's presentation. Uh, we're looking west from where uh, Admiral Way, Avalon Way, and Spokane Street intersect. Um, it's the earliest photo. And here you can see uh, that Elliott Bay uh, came into uh, uh, the area that's now uh, all filled in, including the new core steel recycling plant just south of Spokane Street. The Spokane Street roadway is on a wooden trestle with the Alki streetcars running on a separate trestle right beside it, just to the left of the roadway trestle. Um, in the far background, uh, you see uh, Pigeon Hill, which is a uh, um, a landmark, a uh, geographic landmark here that, that appears in many of these, these pictures. Um, and about halfway to Pigeon Hill, there's actually a, a junction where the Alki line branch, or pardon me, the Fauntleroy line branches off, goes um, down to uh, uh, the Youngstown Business District, and then winds its way up the hill to the West Seattle Junction. Um, the tracks Passing underneath the Spokane Street trestle in the foreground are steam railroad tracks serving a grain elevator on, on Harbor Avenue. They were not streetcar tracks. And I'm just going to try and um, see if I can get. Uh, oops. Hold on here. Okay, can we have our next slide? So, Lori, are you, are you hearing me okay? Hi, Mike. Yes, I can hear you. Um, and I advanced the next slide. Can you see the slides? 
No, I can't see the slides. Oh. It just disappeared for some reason. I wonder if maybe they're behind your Zoom screen, but I advanced to the next one. We're on 26th Street Southwest and Spokane Street looking east. Okay. All right. So, let's go uh, here to the, uh, to the next slide after that. Great, we're at Avalon, Spokane, Admiral Intersection. Very good, okay. During the early 1920s, Avalon Way and Admiral Way were constructed to access routes to West Hall. These new streets intersected with Spokane Street here at this location in the view looking north from Avalon Way. In the foreground is the new streetcar track on Avalon, which replaced the original steep and circuitous streetcar routing between Youngstown and the West Seattle Junction. Uh, next slide, please. Great, we're on the next slide. Okay, so this is another view uh, showing how track on Avalon Way in the foreground connected with the Alki line in the background. By the time this photo was taken in the late 1920s, auto, automobile traffic on Spokane Street was starting to increase pretty dramatically. Next slide, please. Great, and we're on the next slide. I'm actually gonna stop the share and reshare because I want you to be able to see them. Okay. Okay, give me one moment. Can you see them now? Nope. I'll try it one more time. Did that do anything? No. But you know, uh, if um... If the pictures are coming through to everybody else, um, you can just give me the title of the slide and I'll read off the narration. Okay, great. Um, we're at Looking East at Completed Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct. Okay. Um, to provide more separation between streetcar and auto traffic, the city opened a new concrete viaduct for streetcars along Spokane Street in 1930. It ran from the Spokane Street Bridge over the Duwamish to Avalon Way. Um, here you see a streetcar using this new viaduct with a new motor vehicle ramp up to the bridge under construction on the, on the right beside it. This was probably the most substantial part of the whole streetcar infrastructure that existed between West Seattle and downtown. Uh, next slide, please. Great. We're at the next slide, looking north at Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct with fire station on right. The new viaduct included an elevated station to serve the uh, community. The stairway to the station is shown here on the left, and riders made connections here between streetcars and buses that served the Bell Ridge and Admiral neighborhoods. There is still a fire department station, a much newer one, occupying the site on the right where you see the uh, hose drying tower there. Next slide. Next slide is completed Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct from Pigeon Hill. This view looks west from the top of Pigeon Hill, pretty spectacular view really, to the completed Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct. You can see the elevated station and note how the tide flats around this section of Spokane Street are gradually getting filled in. There's a, a years long process there to, to fill in those, um, those tide flats. Next slide. Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct looking west. During uh, 1937, uh, the Seattle mayor and city council decided to convert the entire streetcar system to buses and trackless trolley coaches. This photo was taken of the Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct during the summer of 1940, the last summer of streetcar operation uh, before all the West Seattle streetcar lines were abandoned. Um, so again, you know, this was this 
structure here was only about 10 years old when, when it was abandoned. It was pretty, pretty unfortunate. Next slide, please. Great, and now we're at um, the map of the two, of their bridges. There's a, okay. yeah. We're shifting to the next segment of the route between West Seattle downtown, which is the crossing of the Duwamish River waterway between Harbor Island and West Seattle. Um, the top map shows bridge number one, a sturdy steel bascule bridge opened in 1924. Before then, both streetcars and motor vehicle traffic used a wooden swing span bridge just to the south of this bridge. The swing span continued in service for about two years after number one opened as a streetcar only bridge. But then deteriorating uh, uh, wood pilings in the swing span led to its condemnation by the city engineer. And city officials had to find a, a way very quickly to reroute streetcars to the new bridge. The result was this routing on the upper map, which required construction of new streetcar approach trestles and resulted in traffic conflicts as streetcars tried to merge with bridge traffic. Uh, the lower map shows the final streetcar track layout. By September 1930, bridge number two, to the south of bridge number one, was open just uh, where the swing span had been before. Streetcars operated westbound on bridge number one and eastbound on bridge number two, staying in the middle lanes and greatly reducing traffic conflicts. The new routing complemented the approach to the new Youngstown Viaduct completed in the same year and shown in those previous pictures. Note that the one that the Northern Pacific Railway Bridge, which opened about 1908, is the one constant in both maps. It's still there today, uh, now operated by Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Um, next, next slide, please. So um, this series of pictures kind of gives you a feel for what it was like during this transition, transition that I was outlining in those maps. Um, here's the old wooden swing span bridge that crossed the West Waterway, looking southwest towards Pigeon Hill and West Seattle. Note the very narrow lanes and the streetcar tracks on the bridge. Uh, so all that traffic shared this, this right of way. And of course, the Northern Pacific Railway Bridge is on the left. Next slide. Great, we're on looking east from Swingspan showing streetcar on Spokane Street trestle. Here, the photographer has turned around from the last scene we were looking at and is now facing east towards Harbor Island. After crossing the swing span, motor vehicle traffic used the ramps on either side of the streetcar trestle to reach the ground level at Spokane Street. From this point east, the elevated trestle in the center of Spokane Street was used exclusively by streetcars, but tracks remained in place so that streetcars could still reach the ground level as shown on the left here. So there was, there was a junction here between the old and the new routing. Next slide, please. Great, so now we're at looking east with old swing, swing span on right. New bridge number one under construction is on the left. Okay, the city finally identified funding for a new Spokane Street bridge known as bridge number one in 1923. And here it's under construction that year with the old wooden swing span bridge to the right. Bridge number one would have four traffic lanes instead of just two on the old swing span. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're looking northeast with the old swing span on the right. In this view from 1924, Bridge number one is completed and open to traffic. This photo shows how the streetcars had their own approach trestle to the old swing span separate from motor vehicles. But everything had to merge when you got onto the bridge itself. Next slide, please. We're on the next slide, eastbound streetcar on temporary track. Okay, so, um, 
by the time this picture was taken, the uh, old swing span had been condemned. Uh, it was um, had been taken down, and a new steel bascule bridge was being constructed in its place. In the meantime, streetcars had to have some way of getting across the Duwamish River. So uh, here we have a downtown bound streetcar uh, crossing underneath bridge number one on a temporary wooden trestle to reach the eastbound lanes of the bridge. Uh, next picture, too. And now we're on streetcar turning on bridge number one, heading east. So in this view, uh, that same streetcar has entered the bridge deck from the temporary ramp on the left and is merged into the eastbound traffic. So you get, you get a little bit of a sense here of uh, the drama that must have ensued here when this merge uh, maneuver took place, especially as traffic uh, levels on, uh, on Spokane Street were really growing a lot during the late 1920s. Next slide. Now we're looking at westbound streetcar turning off bridge number one. This photo shows a westbound streetcar on the bridge turning left against oncoming traffic to reach the temporary approach trestle. Uh, like, like I mentioned before, the maneuver must have been something that really tried the patience of streetcar operators and really depended a lot on the courtesy of motorists to, to let the streetcars make their, their merge. It was intended as a, as a temporary uh, measure here until the, the second new bridge could be opened. So next slide, please. Now we're looking east with streetcar approaching to bridge number one. So this photo taken several months after the last one shows uh, bridge number two taking shape about where the old uh, swing span once stood. So you can see some of the new piers going up here in, in this picture and, um, and the temporary streetcar trestle on the left-hand side. Next slide. We're on the next slide, Easton Bridge number one with streetcar merging with traffic. So in this view, you kind of get a, a sense of the uh, kind of traffic volumes that were uh, coming across the Spokane Street uh, corridor, even as far back as the 1920s. Um, so here, a streetcar kind of struggles to merge with automobile traffic from the Harbor Island end. Uh, obviously, uh, the city was anxious to get bridge number two open since all these mergers were both a traffic nightmare and a safety hazard. So next slide, please. Uh, now we're looking at the permanent track being installed on bridge number two. As soon as it was possible, crews installed a temporary streetcar track on bridge number two. Here, the permanent track has been installed on the new bridge and overhead work line workers are installing trolley wire above it. And you can see the temporary track, which is just directly laid on the, on the bridge deck. Um, obviously, the streetcars were running uh, by themselves on the bridge during this, this period of time. Next slide. Now we're looking at the complete bridges, both of them. So finally, both bascule bridges, number one and two, were completed and in service. This scene shows them together with the Northern Pacific Railway Bridge. And basically, this was the um, way people got across the West Waterway um, from uh, 1930 until 1978, when uh, the bridge number one was, was hit by a freighter uh, in an infamous uh, uh, disaster there that caused the, the uh, construction of the, the current West Seattle High Level Bridge uh, to occur. Next, next slide. Now we're looking at the westbound streetcar approaching bridge number one. Streetcars crossed Harbor Island on an elevated wooden trestle uh, in the center of Spokane Street with the um, automobile traffic on the surface um, and unhindered by the streetcars and the streetcars unhindered by the automobiles. Um, the, this photo shows a westbound streetcar with downtown in the background. Next, next slide. Now we are on Harbor Island Station. An elevated station served Harbor Island riders. 
the design of the station was one might kind of say was functional, but probably would not have won any architectural awards. Uh, this scene shows an eastbound streetcar stopped at the station. Next slide. We are looking at the eastbound streetcar on Spokane Street uh, trestle. Uh, Harbor Island Industries developed rapidly during the 1920s. Uh, the, uh, the fill that created Harbor Island was pretty much complete uh, by the end of the First World War, and a lot of industries were attracted to the, um, to the area with its, its good water and railroad access. Uh, the Spokane Street trestle allowed uh, streetcars to avoid delays and conflicts with surface traffic, uh, including cars, trucks, and steam railroads. This scene shows a follow-away car headed towards downtown in the last year of service, 1940. Next slide. Great, and now we're looking at a map of the downtown West Seattle corridor. I put together this map to show where streetcars operated on private right-of-way, that is an exclusive right-of-way, during the 1920s. Streetcars ran on an elevated trestle on Spokane Street, then turned north on the alignment that is now Highway 99, where tracks dropped down to the ground level that continued separate from other traffic. As the line approached Holgate Street, it ramped up to another elevated structure, uh, and that structure had, had two stations at Holgate and at King Street before dropping down to street level once again, for the final time at First Avenue and Washington Street in Pioneer Square. The section between Spokane Street and Pioneer Square was known as the Railroad Avenue line, since it followed a street right of way with that name. Passenger stations were located at Harbor Island, Hanford Street, Holgate Street, and King Street. And they were, um, uh, we have some pictures coming up that show some of those stations. Next slide. Great, and now we're looking at the Hanford Street rail, um, station. Uh, in this scene, we look down uh, from a pedestrian bridge that uh, crossed over the tracks uh, at the Hanford Street station. The Northern Pacific Railroad Yards are on the right, and the Milwaukee Road Pacific Coast Railroad Yards are on the left. Um, if uh, uh, the camera had been put a little bit farther to the, uh, to the right here, you would have been able to see what uh, uh, became the Sears building. Next slide. Great, and now we're looking north from the Holgate Street Station. Uh, here, downtown is on the right, and you can see the funnels of ocean liners straight ahead. The, this elevated station at Holgate Street server, served several important shipyards on Elliott Bay. And worker access to these shipyards during World War I was one of the main reasons the elevated streetcar line was built. Next slide. Now we're looking at the elevated line on the curb to Washington Street. So as it approached downtown, the Railroad Avenue line made a sharp turn from north to the east, ramping down to the intersection of First Avenue South and, and Washington Street in Pioneer Square. This photo show, shows how the line was separated from automobile and steam railroad traffic. It, it's pretty much a, a, a straight shot here from Pioneer Square to uh, uh, West Seattle because of this facility. Next slide. Great, now we're looking west from First Avenue towards the Railroad Avenue trestle. At first in Washington, the Railroad Avenue line joined the downtown uh, streetcar network, which was quite extensive. Uh, streetcars could enter the downtown core using first, second, or third avenues and could either terminate downtown or continue north to, to other um, streetcar lines serving Queen Anne and the North, uh, north End. Next slide. Now we're looking at the abandoned Railroad Avenue elevated behind Spokane Street. Um, or behind the Spokane Street trestle. The Railroad Avenue line has kind of a sad ending. Um, the elevated trestles were built hastily out of wood um, and the city was prohibited from using tax money 
or even basic maintenance on this on this trestle. So much of the uh, city streetcar infrastructure, uh, including the elevated, was neglected during uh, most of its life. By 1929, uh, the trestle had deteriorated so badly that the city decided to abandon the section north of Spokane Street and build a short connection between the uh, Spokane Street elevated and First Avenue South, where existing surface track on that street connected to downtown. In this view, you can see where the Railroad Avenue trestle has been truncated just north of Spokane Street. Uh, and a newly built section of the Spokane Street elevated drops down to ground level on the right. So this, this picture is taken from the intersection of Spokane and East Marginal Way. Uh, you know, even today, this, this is all covered over with uh, uh, overhead roadways uh, that used to be electric railways. Next slide, please. Great. And now we're looking at the new ramp connecting the Spokane Street trestle with First Avenue South. So this view looking west shows workers installing the connecting track between the Spokane Street elevated and the street trackage on First Avenue South. First in Spokane is the, is the intersection here. By this time in late 1929, only the South Park streetcar line used the First Avenue track and the Seattle Tacoma Interurban uh, having been abandoned the year before, uh, was, was no longer using it uh, since the interurban contributed towards the maintenance of the First Avenue track, interurban being a separate company from the city. Uh, the track was in reasonably good shape, but of course it was street trackage where streetcars mixed with other uh, tracks, including automobiles and trucks. So, uh, I wanted to kind of sum up here uh, to what what happened and, and some kind of maybe maybe missing pieces of information that, that, that are really good to know. Um, all West Seattle streetcar lines were abandoned by mid 1940, replaced by motor buses and electric trolley coaches. The wooden Spokane Street trestle was dismantled and replaced by the concrete and steel Spokane Street viaduct during World War II. The viaduct was designed exclusively for motor vehicles and had no special transit provision. The Youngstown Streetcar Viaduct, uh, constructed of concrete and opened in 1928, was demolished shortly after the streetcar service ended. Uh, the Fauntleroy Way Expressway was built uh, pretty much at the same location in 1965. And that connected the old Baskill Bridges uh, with the intersection of, of um, uh, 35th and, and uh, Avalon. The Railroad Avenue elevated, which carried streetcars from Spokane Street to Pioneer Square, was abandoned in 1929 and dismantled almost immediately. Highway 99 now occupies the right of way of this elevator. Uh, from all this, there's, you can see that there's been a long troubled history of transportation between West Seattle and the rest of the city illustrated most recently by the emergency closure of the high level bridge over the West Waterway. And as we've seen, this is just the latest in a series of challenges over the years that have uh, faced West Seattle residents trying to access downtown and other parts of the region. Um, you know, in putting together this presentation, I was impressed by the amount of uh, infrastructure that was constructed for the streetcars and the early recognition that separate right-of-ways for public transportation enhanced both service and efficiency. Uh, it's really unfortunate that the municipal railway did not have the financial resources to maintain the West Seattle streetcar lines, which at their height provided the closest thing to rapid transit in Seattle. Uh, oh, there's a long, com complex history behind all that, but um, uh, there really weren't very many advantages in the 1920s to um, municipal ownership of a streetcar system and some pretty major disadvantages. Um, the, the state Supreme Court had ruled that tax money could not be used to uh, maintain or enhance the streetcar system unless it was a, uh, a specific proposition brought before the voters and approved by the voters. That was a um, um, limitation that, that really plagued public transit all the way up until 1965 
when uh, special state legislation was, was enacted to, um, to allow for public support of, of, of uh, mass transit. So I want to acknowledge the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive for the photos shown in this presentation. Um, the photos came from several original sources, including the Seattle Engineering Department uh, and a few individuals who on their own uh, documented the last years of streetcars in Seattle. Um, that includes Harold Hill, James Turner, Joe Williamson, and Lawton Galley. Um, all these people went out uh, just on their own volition and uh, made sure that uh, the very last years of, of Seattle streetcars were well documented. Um, with that, I, I really want to thank Historic Seattle for the opportunity to, to give this presentation. And uh, I'd be glad to, to uh, try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and thanks to everyone for submitting all of the questions and for sticking with us. Um, we have a lot of questions actually, just kind of cool. So I will just start in the order that I am seeing all of them and you're getting a lot of love in the chat, by the way. Um, so the, you've answered a couple of these, like someone asked about the source of all of the photos. Um, and I think there was also a question here that you just answered about why the streetcars were abandoned. But um, someone wanted to know, do any of the old streetcars remain? And then where can we find them? Um, there aren't very many original Seattle streetcars uh, still in existence. Um, the Museum of History and Industry has a Yesler cable car uh, that is not on display right now, but is in storage. Uh, it's, it's twin, uh, there were two of them that were saved, and it's twin is in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. Um, and that is on display. You can see a, you can go all the way to Washington, D.C. and see a Seattle uh, streetcar. Um, very few electric streetcars survived in the, and uh, the few that did mostly survived just as as, as bodies and not as complete streetcars. Um, there is one in the ownership of the um, Metro Employees Historic Vehicle Association, which is a small um, burning electric streetcar. So that's just about it in terms of uh, what's been preserved. Um, the next, thank you. The next question that I'm seeing uh, is asking about streetlights. <laughs> um, the question is, were there no streetlights to stop the merging of streetcars and um, motor vehicles? I think one of the photos showed what appeared to be like a near collision <laughs> of the two. Yes. Um, traffic signals, uh, you know, traffic lights were slow to come to Seattle. Uh, the, um, the first one didn't appear until the mid 1920s. Um, and it took a really long time to get them um, planned and installed and funded um, at the, the busiest intersections in the city. If you look at a lot of downtown uh, photographs from this era, um, you know, the automobile traffic had increased dramatically. Uh, and at the busiest intersections, you'd have a traffic control officer, sometimes with a little swinging sign here that um, helped to control the traffic. Uh, but uh, it, it took a long time for the uh, for the city to, to install traffic signals, and they weren't always designed or planned with um, streetcars or other transit vehicles in mind. Uh, so th that's that's important to, to consider as well. And, I, and and to my knowledge here, uh, by the end of, of service there on the street on the West Seattle lines in 1940, there were a few traffic signals on, on First Avenue South. Uh, that was a major um, arterial abundance uh, now, but particularly then because it was part of um, uh, the state highway system. And so state money was available to, uh, to make improvements like that. But uh, relatively few uh, traffic signals at other locations. And to the point you just made, there was a question about funding. Um, I want to make sure that I read it the way that it was written. Where did the money come from? come from to fund all of the construction? Uh, the uh, construction was funded uh, of, of this, the trussels uh, directly by the city. Um, and the, uh, 
the street railway actually on a day to day basis they they made their costs they they were able to pay the the uh, costs of, of wages uh, electric power maintenance uh, you know all the necessary day to day things that uh, uh, you you have to do to keep a system going they actually made a small surplus that they put aside in a renewal and betterment fund um, initially that was intended to buy new streetcars um, quite often it ended up having to be used to build facilities infrastructure and to maintain that infrastructure instead um, and, and particularly as the, the great depression set in you know starting in 1929 that source of funding just completely disappeared and, and um, so the streetcar system really started to sink down into a mountain of debt and deferred maintenance. Thank you. Um, our next question is also a money related question. How much did a streetcar ticket cost? Um, and what would that look like today? Well, when the when the state Supreme Court ruled that tax money couldn't be used for the streetcars, they initiated a, a big what was then considered a big fare increase. The, uh, traditionally, the streetcar fare had been five cents a nickel. And with that, you got a free transfer to other lines. Um, in 1923, um, the city increased the fare to um, uh, eight and a half or eight and a third cents. Uh, so, so it was like three tokens for, for 25 cents. Uh, you could buy tokens in advance and they would get on the streetcars and they, they went for the equivalent of of 8.3 uh, cents per. And a related-ish question, um, someone writes that they noticed that in most of the pictures there weren't a lot of writers. Um, and I'm, I mean, you may be able to speak to why that is, but the part two is, do you think that the lines were heavily used at one point in time? Um, the, uh, the interesting thing here is that in the year that the streetcars um, started to be abandoned in 1940, the last one operated in 1941, the ridership was increasing just almost enormously in Seattle because the city was coming out of the Great Depression and there was a lot of new jobs uh, being formed through the defense industries. And so um, the, the, uh, the ridership uh, ended up being uh, oh, almost three times as much as they, what they had expected when they first made the decision to sh shift from streetcars to buses and trolley coaches. Um, the, on a per capita basis, when you look at the number of riders, say in 1935, compared with the number of people in the city, uh, which in 1935 was somewhere around 360,000 people, um, there, there were about uh, 50 million rides um in total taking that year which uh actually is a really high uh ridership per capita by today's standards and i think one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that there wasn't as much of a rush hour in those days you didn't have the big downtown office buildings that, that had thousands of people working in them and the, the streetcar system is more used for just kind of everyday all kinds of travel um, purposes and and uh, so the um, the peak load, what, what, where, where you'd see people standing, was basically just during a very brief period during the, the rush hours. Um, there was an accident, a very bad accident on a West Seattle streetcar line in 1937, that resulted in in two deaths when a car uh, flipped over going around a sharp curve, and um, uh, that car had a standing load. It was uh, it was you know. Uh, somewhere in the order of 55, 60 people on that streetcar. Um, and and uh, it was not entirely unrepresentative of what you saw at that period of time. We've got a couple of questions about um, Burien, and I'll read the first one because I think it answers the second question. Was there any, was there any relationship between those streetcars and the lines that went to Burien? Uh, very definitely. So. Uh, the uh, Lake Burien line um, was built in 1912 by a private company. It was made up of uh, uh, people that were investing in real estate in Burien and White Center and Highland Park. It was kind of called the Highland Park and Lake Burien Railway. And um, 
it basically took you from um, Seahurst uh, in, in the Burien area near, near the Sound um, to the uh, intersection of Spokane Street and, and Iowa Avenue uh, in the um, uh, Youngstown area. And um, that there you got on to another streetcar that took you the rest of the way downtown. Um, the, uh, the line had a, had a really terrible slide, almost a mile of the line was taken out on the, uh, the hillside up above West Marginal Way uh, in 1912, late 1912. And the, uh, the private investors quickly lost any enthusiasm for the line and offered to, to give it to the city of Seattle if they would fix, repair the line and put it back into service. And that was um, uh, one of the two lines that started the Seattle Municipal Railway the public um, investment in uh, mass transit in Seattle. And, th and this on a line that even you know, almost half of it was outside of the Seattle city limits, which was kind of ironic. Um, but uh, the, that line was never a major passenger carrier. Um, it, it lost a lot of ridership to buses and, and uh, uh, automobiles in the late 1920s. It was cut back to the city limits just ran between downtown and um, White Center starting uh, about 1931. And then there was another slide in 1933 that just ended, ended service almost uh, all together, except for a sh very, very short little section about a mile long that uh, served uh, industries along the West Marginal Way. And even that didn't last until about 1938. Uh, so it was kind of a, kind of a long uh, troubled history of uh, the Lake Burien line, but, but fascinating. Thank you. And we have so many, I'm trying to like get to everyone. <laughs> um, there's a question, um, let me go back to the top. Oh, the difference between a streetcar and a trolley. Well, the, the term trolley is um, commonly used on the, the East Coast to describe uh, what we think of as, as a streetcar. Uh, and that the, the term trolley came about because um, the uh, the very earliest uh, electric powered streetcars had a, uh, a boom with a wheel on it that went up and, and looked like it looked like a trolley it looked like a like a grocery trolley that ran along the wire. And um, uh, in, in on the west coast, uh, I think in, in part due to the introduction of uh, trolley coaches, trolley buses. Um, there was there was the attempt to kind of make the distinction between a rail vehicle, uh, a streetcar, uh, and and a rubber tired vehicle that might have had trolley poles on the top to uh, get power, uh, much as Seattle's trolley buses do. Uh, but we're not a we're not a rail vehicle. So I, throughout this presentation, I've I've used the term streetcar because really that was that was what most Seattleites referred to them as, and. Um, uh, even today, um, you know, there's new streetcar lines being built from, from time to time, and uh, they're not referred to as trolleys. They're referred to as, as streetcars. Thank you. And then there are a couple of questions about um, the schedule. So one person asked, how often do the streetcar run? And then there was another question asking if the lines ran at night. Uh, all of these lines, uh, with the exception of, the, of that short little west marginal shuttle, all of those lines had full-time service. They would start at six in the morning and run until after midnight, seven days a week. And um, the, the service levels, I think by today's standards, were remarkably generous, particularly considering that um, even in 1935, uh, in the midst of the Great Depression, uh, most of these lines had at least a, a, an every 15 minute basic service maybe eight to 10 minutes during rush hours. And uh, just due to the nature of the West Seattle geography, they shared a lot of common track. So routes um, uh, two and three, for example, uh, both went from downtown up to the West Seattle Junction at California and Alaska. They were very carefully scheduled so that uh, they didn't come together. Um, you, you had basically a combined headway of about every seven or eight minutes throughout the day. The lightest line, other than the West Marginal uh, streetcar line, was the Alki route, and that ran about every 20 minutes. Uh, basic, it's basic service. 
so that's you know it, uh, when you look back it was it was pretty generous service uh the, the fare was fair, was reasonable um but the streetcars were old and somewhat decrepit uh, there was a question earlier about um, rolling stock. It was, was streetcar rolling stock manufactured here in Seattle? And then what happened to the rolling stock after the lines were abandoned? Uh, most of the streetcars were built by um, what you might call national builders. Uh, there were several companies that specialized in, in building streetcars and it lasted for many decades. Um, St. Louis Car um, uh, in St. Louis, of course, was a big builder of Seattle streetcars. Um, Brill, uh, the J.G. Brill Company in Philadelphia was another major builder. Um, uh, the, uh, there were a few streetcars that were actually built in the municipal railway shops in Georgetown using parts from salvaged streetcars that had been scrapped or were in, were in accidents. Um, there were just, just a few of those, but um, uh, there were established companies that um, got the majority of orders for, for new streetcars. Uh, Pullman was another company, major company, that built uh, streetcars. They were, became really famous for building sleeping cars for steam railroads, but they also had a streetcar manufacturing subsidiary in Massachusetts. So those were, those were the big, big three, I would say, and, and they all had um, examples of streetcars that were sold in Seattle. And I know we're close to our time, so I'll try to get to, <laughs> there's so many questions, which is awesome. Um, this one popped up and I'd love to also hear your thoughts on this and let me find it. Um, as an expert, do you have a particular opinion or any insights on the bridge repair or replacement <laughs> um, and the possible combining of the West Seattle Bridge with light rail? Well, First of all, I, I think the city's decision to repair the existing bridge is, is a, a prudent one. Um, when you weigh all the considerations, um, you know, you have to think about um, the cost of, of uh, lack of accessibility, uh, both in terms of people's time and um, all, the, all the freight uh, function here that that the bridge uh, provides for people getting people and goods getting to and from west seattle so i, I think that was that was a good approach uh i think uh, the unknowns of building a new bridge the scope of what it should include including uh light rail all that all those things and just um the um, complications of, of building something brand new would have, I think, really stretched out the time period it would have taken to um, uh, to build a, a bridge from scratch. The um, the, uh, the concept here of sharing a right of way on a new bridge with light rail, I think, is a really exciting one, and um, would would help to kind of get us back to the thinking there uh, in 1919, where um, the city realized that that having a right of way separate uh, for or mass transit was really something very important. It, it improved service quality, it, it improved efficiency, and it improved safety. And I think that's um, those are all good considerations for designing a new bridge with mass transit as a component. Thank you for answering that. Um, there's a question from earlier that I missed. My apologies. Um, there's a question of what is this? Uh, was there any kind of station at um, first in Washington? I think that was toward the end of the presentation. Uh, there wasn't a, sta a station as such when the when the streetcars uh, came off the the ramp and uh, joined the First Avenue trackage. Uh, there was a stop there just before and after uh, the ramp, uh, and uh, and that that gave you access to to Pioneer Square. And then the part two or the question that came right after that that's somewhat related is. Um, transferring. So if you were on the streetcar and then you got to that part of Pioneer Square, if you wanted to head north, how would that have happened at that point? Well, the uh, the West Seattle streetcars, routes um, two and three, um, they turned on the First Avenue, went north on First Avenue, and made a loop using uh, Virginia and Pine Street. So they turned uh, from um, First Avenue onto Virginia, went south on Second 
and went uh, west on Pine Street back to First Avenue. So, they made, so th that was their downtown turnaround. Um, Route one in 1935, at least, um, was uh, throughouted with the Fort Lawton line. You know, so there were two uh, relatively uh, uh, lightly used lines, uh, Alki and Fort Lawton were combined together and operated on, on First Avenue through downtown. Um, and I know we're, we're supposed to end in two minutes, but the questions keep coming. Would you mind staying to answer? <laughs> um, oh, sure. Okay. Awesome. Um, I'll just go in the order that I saw them. So Kai, our executive director, asked, what originally attracted you to the history of Seattle streetcars? Well, it goes back a, a long ways. Um, when I was uh, in high school, um, I worked as a clerk in the Seattle Public Library's main building downtown on Fourth Avenue, and um, I would, you know, I wasn't a full-fledged librarian. I was a clerk, so I would check out material, get material from the back uh, back rooms and the uh, lower basements. Um, and there was a man that came in uh, periodically. Kind of a little disheveled uh, looking guy and but you know and quiet but he was friendly when you talked with him and, and uh, his name was Leslie Blanchard and Mr. Blanchard um, wrote what up until now has been really the only comprehensive book on Seattle streetcars and um, uh, he was he was there at the library to uh, get material uh, for for his book uh, and uh, both the public library and the um, Seattle Municipal Archives provided him with a lot of the material. Um, and, you know, he did a remarkable job. It was, it, the, unfortunately, the, the book, from a, from a quality standpoint, print and, and photograph reproduction is, is really, really poor, uh, but it's, it's well written, it's extremely well researched. And um, that book is what really got me interested in Seattle streetcars and, and uh, to try and kind of um, relay the message of the, the history of streetcars in Seattle, which is really, really fascinating. And it's all tied in with the history of the city itself, of course. Thank you. I'll ask you for that and I'll include it in the um, follow up email so that folks can check that out. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. So one person asked, um, if you, you to describe how the streetcar sounded, and then the other kind of related question is, how long was the ride from the junction to First Avenue? Um, Not related, but I made them. <laughs> really. I, I think that uh, particularly in its later years, um, Seattle streetcars were pretty noisy. Um, the uh, both the track and the streetcars themselves had been. Um, uh, the, the maintenance had been uh, deferred, and um, there was there were a lot of joints, a lot of squeaks, a lot of you know side to side motion when you rode them. Um, the uh, not having been been born until well after the streetcars were abandoned, it's it's kind of hard to relate to it. However, there is one film uh, called Rails to Rubber that uh, was made in color in 1940. Uh, before the streetcars were abandoned, and uh, they they have some soundtracks showing um, uh, what it was like, uh, kind of from an audio standpoint, to ride the, ride the streetcars. Uh, I think it's somewhat uh, b because the, the film was made a little bit as a promotion piece for buses. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, they probably you know picked the, the some of the worst cars and some of the worst uh, parts of the city trackage. To, uh, to make those recordings and, and films. But um, uh, th they probably were, were pretty noisy compared with uh, uh, motor buses, particularly motor buses and, and trolley coaches of today. Thank you. Um, folks asking for um, recommendations for books and um, any of, of the, res or the content that Mike just talked about, I will share that in the follow-up email. So don't worry, we will get that to you. There is a question um, about 
buses, speaking of buses, did the city also fund buses that succeeded the streetcar and did the bus system adequately accommodate the rising ridership? Well, that's a really good question. Um, the, uh, the city took possession of all but one of the streetcar lines in 1919. And just a year later, they started a bus line, uh, the city's very first bus route. Um, the, the interesting thing here was that, that the, uh, the political atmosphere that um, led to city ownership, municipal ownership, um, kind of was the philosophy that um, the, the streetcar system shouldn't be uh, something that uh, is just making a profit for, for somebody. It, it should be something that's providing a citywide service. Um, like sewage and, and water and electricity and so forth, uh, a utility. And um, it was clear that, that uh, by 19, 19, 1920 thereabouts, that there were many parts of the city that were growing rapidly, a lot of new population, but they didn't necessarily have the, um, the means or the, or the population density to support a, a new streetcar now. So the number of streetcar extensions that occurred um, after the city bought the system was, was pretty, pretty minimal. Uh, there were some extensions in the, in the North End, in Ballard, and on the Beacon Avenue line on Beacon Hill. Um, but the, the big expansion of service occurred starting in 1920 when uh, bus service was introduced to Magnolia. And in the early years, all of the bus lines were feeders to streetcar lines. They, they didn't go all the way downtown. They took you to the nearest streetcar line where you connected uh, to, to the service to downtown. And that way they got the most out of the very limited fleet. Um, and and uh, gradually, the municipal railway added more buses. Uh, in a few places, started replacing streetcar lines with buses, uh, but mostly uh, those buses were used to fill the gap where there was no streetcar service, but there was a lot of people and a lot of development. There's a somewhat related question. Um, someone asked, do you think the demise of the run to Berrien was accelerated by the drawbridge at First Avenue South um, that encouraged automobile use? Oh, uh, un unquestionably. There, there were a lot of, um, you, know, you know, once, in the 1920s, um, it was clear that um, uh, automobile manufacturers were turning out cars that just about everybody could afford um, uh, and everybody was buying, that governments at all levels, including city governments, uh, kind of shifted towards um, their, their emphasis on building infrastructure for, for cars and trucks. Uh, new bridges, new highways, uh, improvements to existing bridges and highways, that is all basically uh, in full bore by the late 1920s. So yes, um, that was a time when uh, when mass transit was uh, first you know, really under a lot of siege uh, uh, because it, prior to that time, it, it pretty much had a monopoly on um, intra-city transportation. Uh, but with the introduction of, of um, automobiles, private automobiles that changed pretty rapidly. Um, and I'll just do two more. So there was a question about the Fauntleroy part of the system or the line. Um, mm -hmm. Like, was that part of the line used very often? Um, there's a note that there weren't many houses built um, in the earlier days and just kind of wondering how people used that. Was it more for leisure given that it wasn't really a populated area of West Seattle at the time? Well, um, certainly it wasn't as populated as, as it is now, um, but the uh, the Fauntleroy line um, served the uh, uh, West Seattle Junction area, which even back then was pretty uh, well settled. And um, the, there was a neighborhood that, that grew up right around uh, the terminal of the Fauntleroy line called, interestingly enough, Endeline. And there are still some, uh, some people that refer to the neighborhood as Endeline. And there's even a little cafe there called the Endeline Cafe because it was uh, close to where the streetcar turned around. And the, um, uh, so the process of, of development in those areas was gradual, um, you know, particularly uh, you know, after, after the city took, took over the system. Uh, but there, there were enough people 
uh, you know, again, given that you needed a smaller population in those days to uh, have, a, have an effective, well patronized transit line because so few people owned cars. And if they did own cars, they only had one. Uh, so there were a lot of people that, that used the streetcar system as, uh, as the principal form of transportation. Thank you. And our last question that we'll take, um, by the way, you've answered like 25 questions. Um, so thank you for staying um, over to answer everyone's questions. Is Could the old waterfront streetcars be integrated into Seattle's transportation system today? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, uh, as everybody probably knows, the, the, uh, the Benson waterfront streetcar uh, operated in, on the waterfront for many years, starting in 1982. But it closed down in uh, 2005 uh, due to the start of construction of the Alaska Way Viaduct. And probably most importantly, because um, the, the site of the streetcar barn was converted uh, into the uh, sculpture park. Um, the, um, th there have been proposals here to reintroduce uh, the waterfront streetcar. Um, for whatever reason, that just hasn't gained any traction. I think that the city has been uh, focusing more on building a streetcar line on um, First Avenue and connecting up the existing First Hill and um, South Lake Union lines. Um, you know, First Avenue obviously runs parallel to the waterfront, but doesn't serve it directly. Um, but that that appears to be the the, the city's approach at this at this time. So it it doesn't look like we will ever see streetcars running on the waterfront again. Well, thank you, Mike, so so much. We're at ten minutes after, and I do want to make sure that we respect your time. This was really fun. I mean, I know when we did our rehearsal back in November, we talked about maybe doing a part two. So if you are still game for that, we would love to have you back. <laughs> oh, I've got lots of material. <laughs> so certainly, yes. I, you know, I, I might add here, uh, just I, I don't want to um, sound, sound too self-centered about this, but, but I am working on a new book uh, on Seattle streetcars uh, that hopefully will be uh, uh, published this this summer, um, and it will have many, if not all, of the of the photos that you've just seen, plus many more. I'm, we're looking at somewhere in the order of 160 uh, photos from the uh, Pacific Northwest um, Railroad Archive uh, in that in that book. So um, so keep an eye out for it. Uh, I think um, Leslie Blanchard. Um, maybe rest in peace. Leslie would be very pleased to see a new book on, on Seattle streetcars that um, really gave people a, 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 a good look at what the unit once had. As soon as that you have a published date, let us know and we will definitely um, promote that in our e news. So, there. all right, folks. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to our sponsors and really thank you for sticking with us through the audio issues. So until next time, thank you for joining.